All right, welcome to the first session of the meeting uh, on time series clustering and classification. Uh, so I'll introduce the first speaker now, keynote speaker for this session. Uh, Professor Eamon Keogh is Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at Houston Riverside. He completed his doctoral work in 2001 at UC Irvine uh, and has won numerous career awards in the intervening time and a number of NSF grants, one of which uh, has funded a series of tutorials uh, on topics of machine learning classification, which are available, or information about, which is available on his website, well worth looking at. Uh, he's an expert in uh, solving similarity and indexing issues uh, in time series data. Uh, and he will talk uh, today uh, welcome, uh, on the topic of scaling time series data mining, scaling upward, I presume, to trillion uh, data series. Okay. So, first of all, let me uh, thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's a pleasure being in that company. If Google can handle my accent, I'd be really, really impressed. I'll do my best to speak slowly. Mm -hmm. Let me jump right into it. And here's the outline of the talk. And I'm going to begin by arguing the following. And I use the word argue advisedly because I'm going to make claims here which actually contradict other people's research and papers. But I'm going to convince you that I'm right and they're wrong. And so my first claim actually is, is that similarity search is the fundamental operation for almost all stream and time series problems. If you can do similarity search very well, everything else turns out, I think, is easy. Classification, question, a number detection, and so on and so forth. That's my first claim. And I'll explain what similarity search is in some detail first. My second claim is also kind of controversial, which is that the similarity search problem actually is now essentially solved. We are effective and as efficient as we basically ever need to be, or ever can be in some sense. And now we should actually spend time looking at these higher level problems, and that's a fundamental research problem. Let me jump right into a bit of five minute tutorial about what somebody search actually is, and then we'll move on. But somebody search requires us to understand what it means by similar. And that really comes down to what are the required invariances for your problem, I'll explain that in a moment. And why is it so important to be fast? You probably already guessed why you'd be fast, of course, but I'll do that also. So here's a quick tutorial. It looks contrived, like it's a real problem we're working on. We have these large archives of historical manuscripts for about 800 years. And let's say we have a query. I find an interesting fish here, and I want to know are there similar fish in 17th century Portuguese documents, for example. So I have my database. I want to search. Here it is here. And somebody search simply says, take the query. Compare it to every single thing in my database, find the nearest fish, in this case, probably that guy there, I'm guessing, and return it as the nearest neighbor. And that's all it's somebody search is. Now, I said similar, and what do I mean by similar? Well, I'm going to have a distance function, here it is here, and distance function is simply a black box, and in the black box, you put in two objects, two DNA strings, two fingerprints, in this case, two fish, and it pops out a number. The number itself has no meaning, but the relative numbers do. So maybe the similar fish actually is 2.7 units, but a different random fish might be a much larger set of units here. And the question actually is, for any kind of data you have, time series in this case, and what you set it in, is what's the right black box? What property should it have? And these are the invariances. So for example, I want my black box probably in this case to be invariant to color. And why is that? Well, the early documents were scanned by Google. They were scanned in black and white. They were being cheap. So actually, I want the distance to be invariant to whether it's colorful or black and white. And likewise, the documents are scanned, actually they're not scanned, they're photographed from a distance, and the camera can move in and out, it can zoom. And so the size of the fish is actually only the apparent size. There's no information. I want to be invariant to this. And for many contexts, of course, the direction the fish is facing, left to right, right to left, makes no difference. I want to be invariant to this. So for any similarity problem you have, the question is simply, what do I need to be invariant to? And once you're invariant to those, you're in business. And I should point out, of course, this is all context dependent. This is true for historical manuscripts, 
But in the real world, if you're underwater with a camera, color will make a big difference. And in the real world, a big fish might be a different species to a smaller version of it. And even this left and right asymmetry actually may not exist in the real world. There are some fish which are asymmetric, uh, flounder in place, and they're either asymmetric to the left or to the right, and this actually would make a big difference. So understanding the uh, invariants are very important, and we'll get to those in time series shortly. And then finally, why is speed so important? Why do we care? Well, the obvious reason is, of course, first of all, that the size of that depth might be quite large. We might have a million or a billion or more objects in this, and measuring this function at every one could be quite slow. But actually, more importantly for what I'm going to talk about today is that very cool algorithms actually call this function of the subroutine many times, maybe a million or a billion times. So no matter how fast one iteration of this is, doing it a billion times pretty slow, it needs to be fast. Okay, one last little point here, which is useful a little bit is if I want to actually, I could search with those fish in the kind of time series space. I can actually take a shape, I can find the center of mass, I can unwind it into a one-dimensional sequence, and I can touch it a one-dimensional sequence. It's actually the lossy transform. And actually, I, I'm sure there's two reasons. One which is we'll pop into a few slides later on. And secondly, it shows an important point, which actually is for many problems, the interesting part actually is changing the data from one data source to another. So I'll show you an example of this on the DNA to time series. Uh, but you can change data from one form to another form all the time. And as it happens, it's a useful trick because often problems are easy to solve in one form. Lovely. Well, finally, ready to look at streaming data, which we talked about, streaming time series. So I'm going to spend the next half an hour talking about the utility of my research. Again, my claim is, if you can do this well, almost all problems are very trivial to solve. So here's a real time series. And some of these search simply means that I could grab a template, like this section here, and I could ask where is its nearest neighbor, its most similar object, anywhere else in this time series. And my guess actually is it could match pretty well over here, for example. So with that one core subroutine, let's solve some problems. The first thing I want to do actually was hinted at in the introduction is find an outliers, anomaly, novelty, and so forth. How do we do this? And there are hundreds of these thousands of papers trying to do this. Here's a nice way to do it in so I search. Let's imagine we take a subsequence here, and we ask, what is its nearest neighbor? So this guy here, it probably nearest neighbor is probably this guy here or this guy here. And actually, for every single sequence here, I can ask the question, what is the nearest neighbor? And the one that has the largest distance to its nearest neighbor, I'm going to call it a time series discord. As it happens, this one section here in red has a very large distance to its nearest neighbor anywhere else, and hence it's called the discord. And I'm going to say I think it's an anomaly. And of course, as you can guess in this annotation here, it actually is truly an anomaly. It needs to be detected and flagged and whatnot. So this is the way I introduced about seven years ago to find anomalies in time series. And reviewers initially didn't like it. They said, it's just too simple. But later on, the perfect evidence showed actually it seemed to work very, 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 very well. And people said, well, it works in spite of being so simple. But actually, that's not true, of course, right? It works very well because it's simple. Because you don't have 15 pounds to tweak, and you can't impose your ideas upon the data set, and it tells you what the numbers you don't tell it in some sense. So pretty recently, within Kumar, did a kind of a bake-off on 19 data sets with nine different techniques, including this one. And as trivial as simple as it is, it works beautifully. It wins basically every single time. <coughs> so my point is, again, that the simple just not search that you solve a problem that people find quite complex, find an outliers. Let's look at another example of when we do some research. Let's do clustering. So the first thing is, here's a trick. You can take DNA, which of course we know is a string of ATCGs, and we can make it into a time series. And it's actually a mean thing to do. So here's a DNA string for a human. And if we see a G, we're going to take a step up one. If we see an A, we're going to take a step up two. A C, we take a step down one, and so forth. So if I scan across a DNA string, I can make a time series. Here's a picture of it. It's actually kind of an interesting picture because it actually has its property being kind of back to everything else. But the point is, we have a time series. And you may know that for most mammals, this string is about 3 billion base pairs long. It's quite a long string. Okay, so I've managed to take a chunk of human DNA, about 72,000 base pairs, 72,000 time series that are points long. Here it is here. And I'm going to ask the question can I find its nearest neighbor of five other primates and then cluster those nearest neighbors? 
So I've done that. Here's our human DNA measure. And the nearest neighbor, perhaps not unsurprisingly, is some chimpanzee. And the next nearest neighbor is some of the gorilla, and then some of the and so forth. And as it happens, this clustrin is actually the correct clustrin for the tree of life from external evidence. Uh, and the branch lengths even are almost like, they're not perfect, but pretty good. So just as in passing, this actually could be a problem with scalability, right? Because not only do you have three billion base pairs for each primate, but you also have to go um, left to right and right to left because the DNA can be transposed. So if you look at a few tens of billions of base pairs, making it scalable is interesting. I'll talk about that a little bit later. The point is, it's a cool question you can do with some microsearch. search. Here's any classification problem you could solve. So here's a mosquito, and which mosquito is it? There are 3,528 different species of mosquitoes. Which one is this female here? And actually, we can solve this with some other search too. Now, I could solve it, ironically enough, with DNA, but DNA actually is still quite expensive and slow and clumsy. I want to do it on cheap. And I'm going to do it with time series once again. So I take the insect, and I put it into an insect read, and then I put it with sensor in the set just to watch her 24 hours a day. And I watched her for 24 hours and watched how active she was. And so this is a midnight to midnight, one day. And during the night time, there's a little bit of background activity. But an hour before dawn, she senses dawn, and she's very, very active. But the moment the sun peeks over the horizon, she simply stops. Does nothing basically all day. And then again, the moment the sun sets in the horizon, the huge breath activity for one hour, and then she begins to do some background again. So I've had this pattern. You might call it a circadian rhythm. It's actually a deal rhythm, but it's basically the same thing. And my claim actually is it's all I need, because as it happens, I've been collecting these deal rhythms, making them basically, in many, many, many different insects. I have a nice archive of them. And I can measure the difference between the one I've observed, but I have a female insect, with all the ones I currently have, and look for the nearest neighbor. And the nearest neighbor here is a pretty good fit. It's actually some aculeus. And that's my prediction for a species, which actually happens to be correct. So the pink one's average over many, many females, but it's smoother, but it's basically the same shape. Uh, no kidding, it's in daytime, and these spikes before and after it's off. So this actually is a little bit um, offline, it's batch. But just like I've mentioned in passing, I want to actually do something like this, but in real time. So particularly, here's my ambition. Imagine an insect 100 meters away, I want to be able to detect that insect sex and species in real time. That's a very, 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 very challenging problem. We've already made some progress with this. So in particular, if you're interested in really cool machine learning problems, I have some students who are, uh, come talk to me. I got lots of data, I got lots of cool problems and sub-problems and sub -sub problems on this very ambitious idea of classifying insects in real time from 100 meters away. But I'll do that offline. Let me show you yet another set of problems we can solve with some market search, this time motifs. So this insect here, a bee leafhopper, is one of maybe four or five thousand species of leafhoppers. Um, these are the insects which cause huge problems to merge. And we're talking about maybe 10 to 12 billion dollars of damage to plants every year. What the insect actually does is she drives her stylus, or she could be a bee in this case, too, I suppose, into the plant, sucks out the sap, and takes the sugar out of the sap. And the behavior itself is pretty innocuous, it doesn't really hurt the plant. But if one plant has a disease, and this insect jumps from plant to plant to plant, the disease will spread through all the plants. And again, we're talking about 10 to 12 billion dollars of damage just in North America alone for these insects. And some cause problems for grapes only, some cause problems for almonds only, and so forth. Uh, this particular one actually, uh, as you might guess, the beats mostly, but it's a lot of plants too. So it's a tiny insect, it's hard to study. How can we study it? Well, of course, we're mostly engineered to like this here. Let's actually wire it up. <laughs> so you can attach a small, tiny gold wire to the insect. It doesn't notice, it doesn't care. And you can ground the wire to the plant, or to the ground itself. And you can measure various things like resistance or whatever is voltage on this insect. And now the insect does its business on the plant, and we get time series. And of course, we all love time series in this room. So we can deal with time series potentially. But the problem is, when you do this for hundreds of insects over uh, months or years, you get just terabytes and terabytes of this stuff here. And what do you do with that? How do you make sense of all this noisy data, right? Uh, it's very, very intimidating, of course. And up to a few years ago, at least, most people were doing this by eye. 
It was simply having my grad students go through this day after day, looking for interesting stuff. And my connection is that even better than that. We can find motifs. So what are motifs? Time series motifs are patterns which are often repeated in the data. So in particular, here just zoom in. This pattern here, the red one occurred here. You can't see it in the scale, but trust me, it's there. And the blue one occurred right here. And so the pattern repeated itself almost exactly twice. And you don't believe that's a coincidence, right? Something happened there causally in behavior to make this pattern appear twice. As it happens, actually, this is a known motif. What it corresponds to is the insect taking its stylet, driving it into the plant, and then withdrawing it just to find a sweet spot. And this is in a very prototypical way, and this is exactly what you get. So we ran an algorithm in the that we found a known behavior, which is nice, but not that exciting. But of course, we can look for other motifs and find unknown behaviors. This is exactly what we found. So here's a motif you can see it repeated twice in the data. Actually, it repeats itself quite a lot in two examples. And we actually have video with timestamps of this data. We can go in and look and see if it actually happened. And this is actually an unknown behavior we discovered. So this is actually a different a leap up of the same kind of thing. Uh, when it takes the sugar out of the liquid, it has some basically liquid that's actually now eject. This is called honeydew. It's also called manna from heaven. In, in the Bible, it's actually almost what manna actually is. But I, I digress. And when the bee feels large enough, she or he shakes its rear end to get rid of this little bee, and the bee bridges the, the uh, plant, and it causes exactly this pattern here. And again, this is an unknown behavior. So here's a cool example of how more teaching find interesting behaviors. The actionability of this actually I won't talk about too much, but it has a such actionability. If we understand the behaviors, when we introduce controls like pesticides, like um, other kinds of things, um, maybe predators, we can now think about how the intervention changes the behavior. I'm going to change the behavior in good ways, not bad ways, of course. So, one exciting thing we can do with motifs, of I'll show you in a moment, is we can find rules in time series. This is actually very new work, unpublished actually, and I think it's very, very exciting. I mentioned in the past that the problem I've apparently solved before but it wasn't. It was never shown actually the algorithm that was shown before finds high confidence rules in quantum mechanical random walk data. So it finds rules, but it's definitely no rules. And the opposite is true. It cannot find a rule, but the most likely to find after one heartbeat is another heartbeat. That's a very obvious rule that we would see very quickly, clearly, right? But the algorithm can't find it. So my point is, um, this actually is not a solved problem, but I'm going to show you actually we have solved it. So here's a data set of time series. And the question is, are there any behaviors or rules in this we can actually find? And it's hard to say in this scale, but actually at any scale, it's hard to see what's going on here. So the first thing I can do is actually I can find some motifs. So I asked the algorithm to find a motif, and it found this. I'm not sure if it will come strong here and here, but it doesn't really matter. It's something like that. And again, when you see this behavior here, it repeats so well, you're inclined to believe it means something. But what do I do with it? How do I use it? Well, one thing I could do simply is I could cut the data somewhere, fucking in half, take the average of the first two pieces, put it here, take the average of the second two pieces, put it here, and I'm going to claim this is actually a rule that this is an antecedent, this is a consequence. If I see this, then I will see this. And I'll totally nothing to worry about, which is what do I need to see this? What's the distance between this and the data that I accept as being seen this? And I actually estimate that again twice the distance between the red and the blue. And then the question is, how long after I see this will I see this? And for the moment, I'm going to say instantaneously. But actually, I can generalize that. So now my claim is I have a rule, and if you give me more of this data, I think my rule will actually predict that data. And of course, prediction is a very, very cool thing to do. If you predict certain things, you can make money or save a heart attack or whatever that So does it work? Again, here's the rule. I looked at new data, and in new data, the rule fired, and yes, it correctly predicted what it would see next. It does actually work. So let me now tell you what the data actually is. This is actually the first two choruses of the Raven by Edgar Allan Poe, spoken by an American actor. And it's transformed into an FCC, just one coefficient. And so that happens, the rule corresponds to the first part corresponds to at my chamber, and the second part corresponds to door. 
So of course, in the ASCII space, it's very easy to do. I mean, in ASCII space, we can find some rules that they famous to say this name at my chamber door. But finding it in real value data is kind of just an insight. And it's not critical to do this because people don't speak perfectly as you might imagine. And the question is, how well does it actually generalize? So it generalizes quite well from American male to American male. So it probably will work for many people in this room if they decide at home. It doesn't generalize quite so well to females. It doesn't generalize quite so well to non-American males. But we're actually working on this, not only for this domain, but for other domains. Is how to generalize this. Now, of course, this actually is, in some sense, a contrived and silly example. Um, but finding rules in data more generally, in astronomy, in telemetry, in, in medicine, or not, is a very cool and problem to solve. And I'll just give you one hint of this. We look for rules not in human speech, but actually in bird speech, or in bird song. So, for zebra finches, which are obliged to sing all day long, we actually looked for some uh, rules. We found some rules. And then we tested the rule on the bird the next day, essentially. And lo and behold, the rule does still, still actually kick in. And we also detected it on other finches, but there were raisins in cohort, and the rule has actually worked yet. And so, why is this interesting? Well, for one thing, other finches actually are used in this nature versus nurture debate, right? Trying to figure out what is cultural and what is innate in the uh, bird. And so by finding out which rules fire and don't fire, we can actually address that. <coughs> Moreover, we can actually take some finches and we can knock out genes. So certain genes like the puppy too are known to actually um, affect speech and behavior and memory in humans, and the analog uh, genes in other finches probably do the same thing. So by basically knocking out combinations of these genes, looking at the rules that fire, we can actually figure out potentially which genes are involved in which part of memory and speech and so forth. Actually, we're doing this right now, we have a grant for this, we're actually not doing it with other things, we're doing it with mice. It tends to actually mice sing just as well, and mice are actually easier to um, manipulate and knock out genes. But the same basic idea, with the same actually interesting results. So I think actually rule finding is going to be a very hot topic uh, in the next few years for time series data mining. Sorry. Okay, so we've seen so far that if you do something such effectively and efficiently, you can do cool stuff. You can find anomalies, you can cluster non trivial data sets, you can find repeated patterns and understand repeated behaviors in the marketplace, in the animal's behavior that might be. You can find rules, and if you can find rules, you can predict what happen next. Basically. So all this is cool stuff, and you can do it in some research, assuming you do it effectively and efficiently. And my strong claim actually is that we're probably pretty close to being done here. We're probably as effective and efficient as we need to be, or can be. So effective facility search simply means that we can recognize similarity in spite of some possible distortions or invariances in the data. So we we'll start, for example, for the images of the fish, they might be invariant to color, might be invariant to size, and so forth. For time series, the zebra finch example, what do you think invariant to? Well, we might be invariant to noise. We always have noise, we can't avoid that. Uniform scaling, in that case, the finch might sing a little faster, a little slower, if it's warmer or cold, we will be invariant to scaling and things like offset, amplitude, and so forth. As it happens, these are almost all critical to take care of. One of them, what I'll explain in a moment, is actually hard to take care of computationally, but we can actually do it. So let me show you just two distance measures that actually are very useful, and explain actually that these are probably all we need. The first is classic Euclidean distance. It's trivial, but very, very hard to beat. So it simply says, given two time series, Measure distance between the eye point and the eye point, and those distances and touch lines here are basically squared, summed up, square root of them, and that's the Euclidean distance. And of course, I'm showing the two things apart here for visual clarity. Normally, I push the two sequences together by z normalizing them so that they're red, they pop up the blue, or vice versa. And for many real world objects, this is a very, very nice measure. So, for example, it turns out that all howler monkeys, sex species, they're basically the same skull. Right? There's not much difference in them. They have this massive jaw here, this kind of resonation, uh, resonation chamber, to make a very, very loud sound. But here, basically, the eye point to the eye point corresponds to the tip of the nose, the tip of the nose, or the base of the jaw to the base of the jaw. And those are beautifully aligned. There's only one kind of howler monkey. And then this measure is called the dynamic time warping. And here's quite a difference. Instead of mapping eye to eye, we can actually map the eye point to the eye plus one, or the eye minus one, or two or three or four. And we can actually map a single point 
to multiple points. Right? It turns out to be this ability to map multiple things, multiple things, and to allow this kind of distortion in the time axis is very, very important for many biological and physical phenomena. So for starlight curve, you know, we have summers here, uh, for heartbeats, of course, for all kinds of behavior, we actually have to be able to do this one to many methods. So my visual example of this actually is gorillas. So the gorillas are highly sexually dimorphic, and the male skull is different than the female skull, much less different subspecies and tribes of gorillas. And so a movement or an um, increase in the size of the brow ridge, in one of the example, corresponds to a shift in the x-axis. And this warping, the number 10 warping, allows you to actually take care of this. So this dynamic time warping stuff turns out to be very, very useful. It's actually anything biological, you have to have it. And many other kinds of physical phenomena, you really have to have this. So I'll show you two of these measures. You clean the distance of dynamic time warping. As it happens, the dynamic time warping is assumed to clean the distance as a special case. So really, I've only shown you one thing with the dynamic time warping. Now, if you look at the literature, you'll find hundreds, maybe a few thousand different distance measures. And my claim actually is that all works. Of course, the original authors would not claim that. They published a paper where they tested their new method against number 10 warping on two data sets. They were better, and they said, thus, we are better, use this. And my claim is they're all wrong. So it's a strong claim to make, but let's actually kind of answer the question empirically. Let's do a bake off. And let's test on every publicly available data set. But to reduce a chance of data bias, of only picking data that's good for us, cherry picking, Let's test in every public data set in the world, and let's beg for every data set we can get a hand on. We have 43 of them. And we actually asked the original authors for their code, for their advice. We ran the algorithms, and we actually showed the results and said, can you make it better, and so forth. So it really is a very, very fair set of things. So I've got lots of results, I can show you all of them, of course. But here's one typical example. Here's a paper that was published, actually, eight or nine papers published in the same algorithm in different places. And the claim was that this actually sequestering is better than lambda warping. That only the lambda warping comes close to it, but really not all the way, it is better. But it turns out actually on fair experiments, it always works. And sometimes actually basically at the default rate. Essentially as good as random. So why did this person and other people make these mistakes? And of course, it's easy to make mistakes in machine learning, right? It's easy to overfit, it's easy to actually consciously, unconsciously bias the algorithms or bias the data sets or bias the choices to make you look good. It's also easy to cripple the libel. So you can get the number 10 warpen and you can implement it in certain ways that are naive to kind of make it very ineffective. Now of course I'm not claiming this individual or any other people deliberately did this, but they have done this. And it turns out actually that of these hundreds of papers that have different measures, essentially they're all pretty much worthless. They're slower and less accurate, have more parameters. What's the point? Of course, there might be a data set out there somewhere in the world in which they are better than the number 10 warping, but I have a found data set, and they haven't. So I think effectively it doesn't get out. So my point actually is that if you need to find this measure, warping is probably all you need, and I have very, very strong proof evidence to show that. So if you believe that warping is all you need, number 10 warping, now the question is, is it effective? Is it fast? Because again, we have very large data sets potentially. And again, if you read the literature, people will say, no, it's too slow to be useful. If you some quotes, the number time warping incurs a heavy CPU cost. The number time warping is limited only to small data sets, and so on and so forth. People pessimistically say the number time warping is simply too slow for real, streaming, large, big data type problems. And once again, they're wrong. In fact, they've been wrong for 10 years, but now recently they've become a lot wronger. And I'll show you why. So, the number 10 warping basically corresponds to taking the two time series and finding a path to this matrix which corresponds to some alignment. And essentially, if you go straight diagonally across here, it's Euclidean clear distance. If you go off of the diagonal, you're kind of stretching time or slowing down time to make one feature map back to another feature. And so any path to this is a warping path, and the path that minimizes the overall distance here is called the number 10 warping. I know I'm glossing over this, but that's all you can know about this. Now clearly to do this for two time series is n squared. You can't avoid that. You can build a matrix with size n squared. But it happens, we almost never want to do one comparison. We have the following situation. We have a long stream of data, maybe a year of customer data, maybe a year of copies of this. 
and we have one query that we want to pass, maybe our section of DNA or it might be. I'm going to find this is best matching anywhere within here. So it's actually naive, it would be n squared large number of times. But about 10 years ago, I found a nice result that says that in this case here, you can just be amortized cost of non time warp from n squared to n in this case. And I must because I did the LBQ. So actually, it happened to be my most famous result, and um, it's widely used. There's maybe a thousand references, of which about half of people actually use this. And so people use a simple idea in motion capture, query by common retrieval, all kinds of problems. It's actually caused an explosion of work in Duncan Warping about a few years ago. But the cool thing actually is, and I make the following claim, which is I can do better. I actually can now solve the problem in amortized constant time. And I really believe actually it's going to open up a whole new area of data mining. The problems that were just simply untenable last year are now finally actually tenable. If we can actually do this in not in square time, but in constant time, we can look at really massive, massive problems. So let's give you some quick examples, and then I'm going to finish up for the day. So we can take a year of heartbeat data, which is about eight and a half billion data points. And by the way, I don't have a year of a single person, but I have hundreds of 24 hours for individual people. I just add them all together. So I can take a year of heartbeat data, and I can search the whole thing for a heartbeat in about 18 minutes. So this is much, much, much faster than real time. Another way I look at this actually is I can actually embed the algorithm into an iPhone or into a small computer on a watch, and I can actually measure in real time on a very, very low power computer. This actually, by the way, is an off-the-shelf Costco machine. It's not a simple computer. Another way I can show you this actually is by the size of the data we're actually looking at. So I call this the uh, UCR ED, it's the Euclid distance version, and the UCR dump and warping, which is the constant time dump and version. So about half the papers in the community that I work in, KDD, ICDM, ICML, and so forth, look at data sets just smaller than a million. Most of them you know, don't get up to a million. We can actually do a million in about an eighth of a second. Only one paper in that community, including Sigma and DLDB, only one paper has ever looked at a billion time series. That happened with my paper three or four years ago. And we can search a billion objects, uh, time series objects, with an time warping in about two minutes. And again, this is the cost of computer, this is not a supercomputer. And then finally, no one's ever, ever looked at a trillion time series. In fact, if you take all the data sets in all those conferences and sum them all up, it's still less than a trillion objects. And we can actually look at a trillion objects in about three hours in a trillion distance, and in about a day and a half for the time warping. So I really do believe this simple result, which will be published in KD this year, it's going to actually change time to time mining in a way. It can simply address problems that are much, much, much larger than were tenable only a year ago. Lovely. So, my conclusions. If you have stream of time series data, semantic search is a very simple idea, but algorithms that use that let you solve almost any problem you want to solve. Outlier discovery, anomaly discovery, rule discovery, repeat discovery, classification, clustering, segmentation, summarization, visualization, really all comes down to fast, clever semantic search. My other claim is, with very, very few exceptions, the runtime warfare is probably all you need. There's something else with the outside that's better than that. And not, my final claim is that, based on unpublished results, that doing the runtime warfare on billions or trillions of objects is not actually tenable. We can now do that, or we couldn't do that last year, and certainly couldn't do it a few years ago. Great. At this point, I'm done. If there are any questions. <laughs> Sir. Um, OK, you're searching uh, through a large database for something. And of course, everybody knows one of the hard problems is um, how do you evaluate the significance, the statistical significance of the search? Stop when you found something interesting. So there, there are two related questions that I have for you. Um, to solve that question, you need to know what you were looking for in the first place. No method can find all possible rules. You, you must have some set of patterns or rules that you are looking for in the first place. So the first part of the question is what is, what is that uh, description of that set? And then how do you, at the end, evaluate the statistical significance of that? Is that a great question? Uh, I like it. So the question that we came back to you is, is how do you know the significance of what you find? 
So if you do outside discovery, you do real discovery and so forth, how do you know if it's interesting and significant? Um, so part of the answer to the question is, in some cases I don't. So I imagine that my lab, my skill set, is actually finding these patterns. And if I have a significant, it's something that I'm not a skill, I'm not a statistician, I can do some stuff with it. Um, but in some cases, actually, the answer is external evaluation. So when I found these patterns, I went to the video and looked at this technologist. So in some cases, the answer is kind of trivial. We ask someone to kind of follow the test. Visually, you might say here, it's actually clearly significant kind of visually. But there are some things that we can do in some cases. We're actually looking at MDL in the description of them to not only find patterns, but basically score them and how likely they are to happen by chance. And if we know that it's very unlikely to happen by chance, we will give it some significance. That's one possibility. And another possibility is you can kind of learn the threshold. So, um, let's see here. So, this example here, we found an anomaly, and it's actually how do we know if it's significant? But well, assistance to the scenario to neighbor is say five. In previous data that was undertaken, we did the same kind of test, and this is the nearest neighbor is always at a large distance, it's only 1.2. So we simply say that compared to previous jump launches, this one appears to have a greater discord. But the general question, so there are some domain specific tricks you can do, but the general overall question about significance, I fully admit it's an open problem in almost all cases. And we almost always now at least with our kind of ad hoc to make kind of tricks. An overall theory of that would be wonderful. And probably not exactly that proportion. I don't have that skill set, but I'd love to work with somebody here who's talking with that. Another question? Sir? How is this applied to multivariate uh, data? So how does it apply to multivariate data? Multivariate data. So I've shown you basically one dimensional data that's easy to see uh, on a screen, but almost all these algorithms could be applied to multivariate data. Uh, the only problem with the right data is, of course, that with enough variables, they tend to get all the correct dimensionality. You want to do one example of this, we use some data set for American Sign Language. And the original data set has I think, 64 dimensions. So every single finger band is recorded, the exact position of patients and so forth. And we got okay results in the dimensional data, but if you throw away all the four dimensions, it turns out, you actually get much better results. So really, in that case, the clever thing actually is, is throw away the other data, throw away the redundant data. And of course, there are tricks to that, like FPG and other things. Once again, we often reduce the kind of domain dependent tricks of asking the expert motion capture, asking the entomologist, which are the features. That's kind of a more general problem. But once you have to buy features, mm -hmm. all the algorithms generalize clearly. And what they should have. About 150 variables. Again, my previous experience with Jeff, there are very few problems in the world that need more than five variables. So, of the 150 you have, my guess actually is that either directly four or five them, or something a combination of them, that four or five, will probably be enough. Uh, and if you use all 150 of them, you probably will get bad results. So, the step you have to do to go from 150 to four or five, I, I really can help you with other than my consent experiences. But if you do that off line by ourselves as an expert, and you need to have to that all this stuff works off the shelf. Uh, with uh, physiological data, yeah. it is uh, not a good idea to get rid of variables because we don't really know how many affect each other. So we really don't want to eliminate variables. So it really stays to 100 and 50. Uh, I think that if my colleague David Kale could be talking about it, then he has some data sets where, for some diseases actually, you need these three or four dimensions. But for different diseases, you have to actually different dimensions. And really, I have no way of knowing that. And algorithmically, I might not discover it, but maybe not. So kind of pushing into the general domain expertise really is helpful there. I think <laughs> my goal is to build totally black box algorithms, but it's always going to be very difficult. It's always going to take some expert experience with a little bit of attention, or at least within the loop for multi relations. But how about other categorical data or point process data? Do you still do some dynamic time walking on those sorts of data? And if so, how do you go? But there's a danger that I'll uh, come across in the guy who has a hammer and every problem is a nail. But in many cases, you take part of the data and you can make it into time series data. So I want to show you that DNA is actually very quickly changed into this. Think about text to be actually changed into the time series, or the first text to be changed into time series. So my first pass is often to take the data and make it the time series as possible, simply because I have fast, efficient tool algorithms for that. If it really is pretty categorical, you can't need to change it into the time series. Then, yeah, you have to kind of somehow link these things together. 
and then a mixture of these things, how they are from binding and series, it becomes a bit tricky. But it depends on these ideas will work using an extra wrapper rather than integrate with the how they are from that. How about point process? I don't know what that means. Uh, you have uh, event tasks like say is an earthquake day. Um, Again, without I think about thinking about my guess is probably some transformation might actually just tweak that into kind of a time series. Uh, I mean, even things like graphs and XML, it's a bit unnatural, but it can put into the time series, and it can really be very fruitful. And often you hide that from the user. So the user is looking at graphs or trees or XML. In terms of the time series algorithm is working, you can give the results back. You can transform back into the XML again, essentially. Uh, but to make it fast and efficient and effective, it's a turn it into the time series. So if you can find the right method, I'd probably help you. Sure. Curious in the in the DNA sequence example, how you try obviously the encoding from say A is e equals one, C is e equals two. That encoding is completely arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. Have you tested whether if you use an alternate encoding, obviously the, the shape of the time series is going to be different, but whether the ultimate results are robust against playing with that encoding? Uh, it's a good question. The answer is we have tested that, and it makes no difference what we do. Uh, but it is yeah, it's best. Uh, it makes no difference. Mm -hmm. But it is not a certain animal, but it's not all of the four basic features that's like known. And maybe you could point out that it's a little bit higher variance than it might be. But at least in principle, that kind of rough scale we're working on, it makes no difference what the curve is. We don't know what's under the hood with your algorithm yet. I guess we'll have to wait to find out your order constant. But uh, I assume it's parallelizable. Uh, in the sense that the quarter constant may not be fast enough for some application? Uh, it's actually, it's pretty paralyzable, so if you have uh, hardware to code this, that's part of that. Yeah. Just on your example of the possibility of the algorithm, you have to see. The Yeah. What were the size of the example? You said that you had a commodity. You see? Oh, yeah, sorry. That's you, um, you ran out of billion vectors. What, what were the sizes of these vectors? Uh, so the time has a length of trillion, the query is length uh, 128. But actually, uh, because of a constant time, essentially, the length of it is almost irrelevant. So if it was twice as long as time series, it might be a tiny fraction slower, but not much bigger. So you're just imagining you know, RAM, you know, scrolling that data. Uh, so actually, the time I showed you actually includes a disk at this time. So it's about, I think, 8 terabytes sitting offline. But it's just on a very cheap external hard drive. It's not actually this problem that this time would be relevant compared to the two time. So it's about eight terabytes of value on the hard drive. Right. You mentioned noise and invariant. Do you have a way of incorporating known measurement noise estimates? You have two time series, you know this one is noisier than this other one, or this particular sub is you know, ten times noisier. Do you have a way of incorporating that into the search? Uh, Maybe. So, in a certain case, actually, we have a measure for complexity uh, from that set. So, now that the bias of something that measure for complex things, then the more complex things, if it's required away, then you expect otherwise than simple things that you do. And we can actually adjust for that. So, these measures actually do allow kind of the main kind of adjustments. So, it might be that if you understand the domain very well, it might be. You might have to say, <coughs> take the log first and then do this, or whatever it might be, just kind of smooth. And essentially, anything you do, you can then and probably it not to do. So you can tweak a pre-process, or even push some these ideas into the measures directly, and it's probably no different between kind of uh, time and what uh, I But again, it kind of requires you to understand the physics of the domain. Uh, I don't know where hands off that. Yes, do you have any idea of the distance uh, Google correlates to you? Google correlates. Uh, it's being just function of the uh, Oh, yes. And do you have any idea of the kind of uh, instance they use for this instance? Uh, I haven't worked with the um, Google Trends thing. Um, I have looked at, you know, 40% Microsoft and some of the data that they sent to this. And actually, I have looked at this a little bit. Such and such and that, but I don't really have any great experience or feedback with that. Yes, yeah, so PGM, the same slide, you need more than. I can't find that. Yeah, 
Um, but the question was about involving the lag. So for the uh, rule example, the finger in the first example took it to Raven, I said there's no lag. So immediately after the as seen by the consequence of having uh, But actually, we generalized this actually to handle the finger very ill. We need a nice example of this. We had a set of archives in iPhones, and we found this data set where we actually got this beautiful kind of a concave lip, and then a flat piece, and then a reverse concave lip, and a flat piece. And what I tried to do is the elevator. You went to the elevator, and there's no acceleration initially in this direction, of course. The elevator starts up, and you get this kind of acceleration. The elevator stops, you get a little bit again. Now, the linear lag between those depends on how many floors you have. So we learned the rule in our building, which has four elevators, uh, four um, floors, and we had a maximum lag. But of course, I go to New York to have these new skyscrapers, the lag can lead to be much, much larger. Um, so we, we never had a little bit of that uh, from that. And of course, the main expert can come in and manually edit that, saying, in Hong Kong, we need a longer lead lag. Uh, but so that will be the main dependence, of course, too, for finches and for that, having to put it how do you put the coding shape in the time series? Do you yeah. get something that's not star shaped? How do you put that? Uh, I'll show you one way to take a shape and make it the time series. There's at least 20 different ways of doing that. And some are better for kind of convex or convex shape, some are better for spiky or smooth shape. The answer to that, I don't really care. Um, I need those ways to focus your data set, do it, and give me a time series, and I will do search for uh, But there are many mapping. The question I've got you tonight is because it's lost. It's actually one point mapping. The is lost. Mm -hmm. But to some extent, I, I don't care how you take it. Is that not because that's just a void? Because there's a, there's a sure, I mean, it's, again, there are at least plenty of ways of doing this. And some actually do work with donuts, like whole time. Some don't work for donut shaped things. Um, just pick one that's popular to me. And whatever it is, you can series, and it's all work for you. So, a related question. If you had an image and it is a grid of pixels and each one has a value, can you? Uh, encode that to the time series as well. So the question is, you have a, a grid, you have a box solve and brain scan, and you have values at each part of the grid, and you have to make it time series. You actually have done this like a Hilbert uh, space time chart, where you actually fill the space, and you take the single path and stretch it out, and measure that curve, and it's kind of there for calculating on that. I have it personally, but I told you actually have done that. And again, people I know have done that and used some of the algorithms. So there are many ways to do that and map the time series, and these are kind of main dependent. Once you do it in a meaningful way, I can probably help you a little bit. Uh, but how you do that will depend on properties of your data basically. So you mentioned about uh, reflecting images before you do a mapping yes. process itself. What about things like rotating algebra when it's thinking of the character? It's actually a good question, but it's an example of the main dependent invariances. So, um, so the question is basically what kind of variance do you want in this example? Almost certainly the after life has no meaning. The question is, will you allow location variance? First of all, if you do want to allow location variance, I can tell you the time series space. Because location variance becomes stage invariance of time series space, you can easily deal with it. When you want to not depend, right? So if you imagine the letters, I don't want to rotate the D, the rotated D and not become T. Right? So I can't do the rotation there. I might do a limit rotation, I might say it's easy to rotate. 10 degrees, half by parts, but no more than that. But that's the question is, there's always the kind of the main attendant information you have to put in. You can strain the warping, you can strain the phase variance, and kind of this. And you usually have to either learn those and not to die, or have an extra plug. But the other question actually can handle essentially any of the variances, whether it's offset, scale, rotation, phase, measurement scale. We can handle all of those. Just tell us which ones to handle, or give us that we can learn that. So the question is how do you deal with irregularly sample data sets? So um, right here we have every single point, so we have every single point here. What happens with emission points? Yes, I have actually a magic solution to that. If we have a few emission points, it will smooth the heart rate and will walk away. But if you have significant amount of emission data, your entire gains emission at a space launch because of bad weather it is. Um, the answer I don't actually know. And again, maybe some of the main tenant trick would handle that. Um, but the problem is like for electrical power lamps, we basically have a problem occasionally, and we go to last year's data, take last year's data, and put it in place this year's data. And for some problems, that works fine. For some problems, that can cause a huge uh, problem, like because 
Maybe last year the World Cup was on day. This year the World Cup is not on that day. And we had some heavily biased uh, results. Here. So it, it's a generally tough problem that I have to be very hard to Are you able to point to sample code and a data set for this approach? Oh, sure. It's actually, it's actually that um, I religiously believe in giving away all data and giving away all code. So if you go to my website, find my email address, or uh, I'll be online. Uh, I need the code and family one. It's all yours. Thanks so much. Okay, we have a couple more questions. Uh, so, as predicted, Google did terribly in picking up your accent. <laughs> uh, if you look on the tag side, it says New York and Pizza Hut. <laughs> 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 so, uh, have you, uh, you've obviously talked about doing um, some sort of speech recognition uh, and just essentially mapping parts of speech. Um, and you showed us the color example. Have you tried this with sort of a speech bank and done this in a generic way where you actually try to do better than what we, we have here? That's actually, I, I have not actually, actually, I only use a speech version because actually we all know the right answer and it's kind of intuitive. But I, I have no particular skills in speech. Speech normally, of course, is a very high dimension, maybe 44,000 hertz signal. And the MRC thing I do makes it into a low dimensional, relatively smooth changing thing where I can find rules in it. It's never a good transformation. But in terms of actual speech stuff, I'm not an expert in that, and I'm not going to take it down. I'm only using it as an example of what I can do. But in terms of your, in terms of your search, you're not actually trying to find rules, but you're just trying to find matches. This is a perfect example. Oh, yes, actually. That is a big bank of, of people speaking. <coughs> you have those well labeled. And for you, uh, you can speak, you can just search. No, this is actually so. The only time Warpin actually is very competitive with everything else in speech, in terms of, you know, market market that might be. But I'm saying tends to perform almost as good as anything else out there for speech. It's a very simple algorithm. People often use it because they say it's too slow. But again, I'm hoping that will change uh, people's minds. Actually, it is very, very fast. So we can search speech much as fast in real time, even on a low power device now. Uh, just to argue with you, uh, what I said about speech, uh, what you had said where you weren't able, you were able to do a male American accent, a male American accent, but weren't able to go to the female or foreign accent. A lot of the challenges of looking at speech involve two varieties of speakers. People like you and I that are harder to understand than most people in the room. A lot of channel effects. And yeah. I mean, try to be very difficult with the channel effects. And a lot of what makes uh, actually searching speech and doing effective speech text work harder than a lot of venues are exactly the same thing we were talking about that tends to help with the next channel effects. So I think you're overstating. So now it is true that um, uh, I think maybe I could do better speech if I deliberately, you know, if I took the time to understand it better. That people have this very ability to get excited to talk faster, and get calm to talk slower. I can actually encode that for you from a statement, and I can encode some other things that actually might help me more than very accent, more than very and so forth. Um, again, it, it probably takes some of the main work to map that and to disturb that into the MRPC space. If the data in that space is reasonable, it probably can actually help you a lot. Actually, you know, I want to point out that actually, I'm not an expert in speech, but people do use the of in speech and it is quite successful and quite uh, competitive. But they do understand speech better and actually do these kind of transformations and tricks to develop high speech in their computer. Mm -hmm. Let me ask a similar question actually since you mentioned these and these earlier. Does it still apply on optical characters of the Um. Uh, we have actually, there are transformations of single characters and even kind of words into time series things. Uh, so we actually have that as far quickly for um, talk manuscripts. So someone can actually look at sort of Washington's, you know, one of the million word writings. And it, it's joint hand writing. They take the top profile and the bottom profile is joint word and it becomes two time series. And you search in that space and it actually is competitive with all the other approaches. But many approaches can be kind of this is into a time series type of a problem. And usually that happens, if the map is anyway reasonable, time series is both A affecting, so the hands match are very dope of human lightning. And it's quite efficient now, as you can see. Actually, I was more interested in something that is printed but not English, because for many Asian languages, there are no good optical characters in like this. And if given printed text, it's going to be easier to do an interpretation. I think that's what we actually have tried for some things um, uh, like Croatian and Thai. Which is, you know, it's hard to find good off the shop that kind of product, but I'm sure I'm going to be able believe that. Uh, and actually, we actually have some better results. It's kind of special to the main, and actually, no one's talking about that domain, like, assembly to be assembly, no one's trying to think, can I 
can help. I don't know that specifically. But just a quick tap to try this thing, actually, it works quite well. Okay. I'm going to finish up the question on my own. A more abstract one. You, you clearly worked in, in a number of domains, and in answering these questions, a number of domain specific questions, and you've indicated a couple of times the difficulty of tackling problems in different domains with a single tool, and there's challenges to each domain. I wanted to ask you to reflect a bit more on multidisciplinary and, and domain knowledge. I think it's of interest to everyone here to understand a bit more about how to generalize ideas between the domains. Okay. Uh, so this question, I do work in lots of domains, but it's interesting stuff. Uh, one of them actually is um, NSF, LightSet, and uh, some community like it. So I've actually published a paper with anthropologists, neonatologists, entomologists, herpetologists, astronomers, cardiologists, there's a few other things in there. And so it's actually it's like fun, interesting, and yeah, fun things to kind of like that. Um, I kind of actually build sort of tools that are kind of abstract, that is a layer where you have to think about it, you have to clean it, you process it, and normalize it to make a kind of time series thing. But once you've done that, you can plug it into various tools and you can find the anomalies, the outliers, the big patterns, and so forth. So it is an abstraction matter where we can actually have a domain expert typically tell us that this doesn't matter, but this does matter, and this matters a little bit, what it might be, and that transformation. But it shouldn't be a black box beyond that point, I think, after that. And what I read domain expert is some of them really know what they want, but really can't express it. You have to really work very carefully with them, kind of tease out of them what it actually is. Often say you could acknowledge, and they can't do their mapping as easily as they might have to do. Uh, but it makes that very fun, makes that. Fantastic. Okay, let's thank you again for a wonderful talk. Can I invite Damien to come up?